If you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 8. I'm going to dive right in because I don't know what's going to happen and I want to leave some space. Amen? Amen. And so as we dive into this story, we've, we've seen baptism today. To give you some history of Acts chapter 8, what, what we're running into historically is that in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost happens, man, and Peter steps out on a stump or a rock or whatever it was, and he proclaims Jesus Christ. And he does it in a way that's not, and he does it in a way that's direct. He steps out there and he says, this Christ whom you crucified, it's pretty straightforward. And he tells the story of redemption and this gospel story that through Jesus's blood and that sacrifice on the cross that you and I could have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. And what a great, great message that was, but it didn't stop at Pentecost. That day, that day, 3,000 people were added to the church. A couple chapters later, we see another moment where there's a sermon preached. 5,000 people were added to the church, and this thing starts rolling. And God, let me tell you something about God. He is intentional. Everybody say amen. Amen. So, so God's not, there wasn't a thing in your life that happened where God woke up and went, what, what? what? Didn't see that coming. That's not happening. So here's God laying out this plan of the spread of the gospel through the New Testament and through the book of Acts. And we see these miraculous things happen. Chapter two, chapter three, chapter five, chapter six. We start getting into some of the heavier stuff, persecution, story of Stephen, follower of Christ. And as Stephen is proclaiming Jesus Christ, the the religious people go, no, 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 this is, this is challenging our way of thinking. This is challenging our belief system. This is challenging the way to do it, and we can't have that. And so they throw Stephen in the pit to stone him. And standing all around the pit are people of the city, and they've got their rocks, but they're a little encumbered, so they take their robes off, and they hand them to a gentleman who's standing there whose name is Saul. Now, you will know Saul maybe from his later exploits as a gentleman named Paul. But initially, he was contrary to Christ. He was an enemy of the cross. And he stood there and held their coats while they threw stones at Stephen until he died. And even in his dying breath, the Bible says that Stephen looked up into the heavens and still proclaimed Jesus Christ. So you see this radical thing happening in the early church where just, man, whatever happens, to God be the glory. Whatever happens, to God be the glory. And so God gets real intentional through the Holy Spirit about the spread of this gospel. Because right now, it's kind of centralized to Israel. It's pretty centralized right there. The, the journeys that Jesus had in, in and around Jerusalem and into Samaria a little bit. And, and we have these disciples going out. And in chapter 8, we run into a disciple named Philip. And Philip is there and he's waiting on the Lord to, to give him some direction. And I want to give you, I want to give you a, a statement here that I believe to be true. In fact, we've already seen it to be true today. God's direction always comes with an opportunity. He may not give you a destination, but he will give you an opportunity once he gives you direction. We see this in the Old Testament when he tells Abraham, I want you to get up in the morning, saddle your donkey and go. And our question would immediately be, go where? And God goes, <laughs> that's it. That's, he doesn't tell. He says, go. Well, in Philip's case, in this story, in chapter 8, we're going to start down around verse 26. We see something similar happen. And what happens is this. Now, an angel, verse 26. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go. And he gives him a direction. South to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Now, if you'll notice in the scripture, there's not quotations around that this is a desert place. The quote from the angel says, rise and go to the south, get on the road that goes down to Jerusalem from Gaza. That's what we get from the angel. Now, on that journey, when Philip decided to take a step in the direction that God wanted him to go, here's how faithful God is. And he arose and went, verse 27, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. So God gave a direction. And once Philip said yes to that direction, he created an opportunity. 
We've seen this this morning. Devin is a young man who's been coming to the church. And I say young man, I don't know how old he is, but he's going to appreciate that I called him a young man. But a few months back, I don't, it's not even been that long ago. How many of you have been coming for a couple months and you came and we had a cow out front that you could swing by and pet? Anybody? <laughs> how many were here for that? Devin and his wife brought the cow. Had never been to real life before. They brought a cow to church because we needed a cow at church because, well, just because. <laughs> we didn't sacrifice it for those of you that didn't know. We didn't do that. But uh, they brought this little cow that we could pet and the kids, were, they had a great time with this little cow. And Devin and his wife came to church that day and they were like, hey, is it okay if we come back? And I said, yeah, you bet it's okay if we come back. Come on back. You come on back. And here's the thing. He didn't know anything but a direction. Jason, God said, I want you to come back. I don't, okay, I'm coming back. I don't know what to expect. This morning at the end of service, he said, it's time for me to do my part. I have to get baptized. He said, I have to get baptized. And so just like that story, this is something that you guys get to see. We, we get to live it out, what Jesus is saying in this word. If God gives you a direction, he's going to give you an opportunity. If he gives you some place to go, here's the challenging part, church. He's going to give you something to do. That's not always easy. We all want to hear from God. I mean, most people say, man, if I just knew what the Lord wanted me to do, maybe you don't need to be praying. What does the Lord want you to do? Maybe you need to be praying, God, where do you want me to go? And he'll give you the do once you take a step. Where do you want me to go? Because that was the command, right, at the end of the gospel when Jesus ascends into heaven. Go, therefore, into all the world. Then the do, preaching and teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Go first, be willing to go. And so we see Philip being willing to go. He goes, he gets this opportunity. You're probably going to get tired of me stating this fact throughout the sermon, but if God gives you a place to go, he will give you something to do. And what I want to preach to you about is how do we handle that do? How do we handle that part of it? Because a lot of us aren't prepared for it. I'm going to say this Christian or non-Christian. I'm going to talk to you Christians for a little while, but then we're going to give an opportunity. I want to make sure everybody understands and knows what Philip is doing. Because there's two characters in this story. There's Philip, the one who's following Christ, and then there's this Ethiopian guy who is what's called a proselyte. He was a follower of Judaism from Ethiopia. Now, if you don't think this is strategic in God's plan to figure out how to get the gospel from Jerusalem to Central Africa, then you don't know how big our God is. He said, this is going to work out good. Philip, I need you to go on the road to Gaza out of Jerusalem, and I just need you to trust me. Go. Philip rose and went, and there's an Ethiopian gentleman in his caravan. So he said, what do we do? What did Philip do? I'm going to give you a couple things real quick, but I need you to lean in. Because some of you, God's called you to go He's given you a direction. And here in a moment, some of you, he's going to call you to do something. And you've had every excuse in the world to not do it. You've had every reason in the world to stop just short of it. And I want you to follow through today. Whatever it is, I want you to follow through today. And so as we dive into this story a little bit more, I'm going to finish that. He was the king, or excuse me, this Ethiopian was the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. He had a pretty high, if you get to handle the money, you got a pretty high seat. Amen? So this is where this gentleman's at. So here's what, here's what we learned from Philip. The first thing is this, be eager to engage. How, how many of you are eager people? Would you say you get excited about new opportunities? And Anybody? Like four of you. Okay. <laughs> How many of you are a little, little maybe a little uh, timid in new situations? Okay, you can be both and. It's all right. Jesus uses all of us. I don't, this is going to be hard for you to believe. There's not many situations in my life that I'm timid about. I, I don't mind no. I don't like it, but it typically doesn't stop me. Okay? I've always figured if when I was doing sales, if you told me no, then, then I'll go ask you. And if you tell me no, I'm going to go ask your wife. And if your wife tells me no, I'm going to go ask your neighbor. And I just figure that's the way that's supposed to go. If you tell me no, I'm going to go till I find a yes. The problem is we get talked out of that in the gospel because we just, we just don't, we're not real eager about sharing the gospel. We don't show an eagerness about sharing the gospel. And it concerns me a little bit because the reality is of that which we find valuable, we share with people. 
Because I promise you, that little picture we showed just a second ago of Mallory Jewell, uh, of Dylan and Jessica's, that little baby, I, I guarantee you, you don't have to know them right now. But if, they, if you get an opportunity, they're going to be like, hey, this is my kid. Look, look what we did. <laughs> look what we did. So they're eager to share that. I want to I challenge you a little bit to remember what it is that God has done in your life. What has God done in your life? I promise you it's been good. It's been good. You may not recognize it. You may, you may, not, you may not always appreciate it, but it's been good what God has done, and we ought to be eager to share it. I, I, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm wired a little bit different. Uh, I, did, I did, had to go to a lot of schools growing up. Not, not anything bad. I wasn't a troublemaker, but I went to nine different schools before I started high school. My dad, we would move several, because my dad was a pastor and my dad was a builder. So he would come into a church and he would make sure it was good. And then we'd move on to another church to so he could make sure it was good. So I, I got to move around a lot. What it made me really good at was the first day of school. How many of you, how, uh, just a poll, how many of you loved the first day of school? Hands, put them way up if you did. I need to see who I'm talking to. How many of you, the first day of school absolutely terrified you? Okay. See, I believe that on the first day of school, DJ Peace ought to be on the hall and every kid gets walk-in music. Like, that's how I think the first day of school should go. Because my dad worked for Sears, so my mom would wear out that Sears catalog used to get, the big thick one, and man, I'd get my clothes in, get the new shoes, get the hair cut right, and man, when I hit school, I strut, and I'm like, it's new day. I'm going to meet everybody, and I'm going to be everybody's best friend. Why? Because it's a new school, and I got one option. I can either be excited about it, I can, I can be excited in the moment, or I can let the moment overwhelm me. And that was a choice that I had to make. And what we do with the gospel is the same choice. We can be excited about the moment, or we can talk ourselves out of the moment before it ever happens. And we do that with the gospel. We, for some reason, we've lost an eagerness. We have Pastor Vince. The world right now just pushes against Christianity. They do because they don't know. Or they know some part of it, some, some messed up part of it that they heard from an uncle at a family reunion who's never been to church in his life, but he read an article in some magazine that he picked up at a doctor's office, and this is what he believes about God now. And so now I don't know about that church stuff. That's because they don't know. I don't, I'm, listen, I love church because it is the movement of God, but I love Jesus and it's what he's done in me that has to come out of me. And I ought to be eager to share that. Philip is eager to share that. How do you know he's eager to share that? Look what the verse says in verse 30. It said, the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. Look at Philip's response. So Philip ran. He's like, come on. I said, spirit whisper in my ear and tell me in my heart, I got to go talk to this guy. I don't even know what's over there, but I'm going. <laughs> and he runs to this chariot. And as he gets there, he hears something familiar. You see, Philip was a Jew. He would have been, he would have grown up reading the Old Testament. And as he gets there, he hears him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he goes, hey, I know this story. You know why Philip knew the story? Because when God provides a direction, God provides an opportunity. And not only does he provide an opportunity, but he'll equip you for the opportunity that he provides. God's given you enough. You realize that? God's given you enough to share the story. He's given you enough to be excited about it. But we sometimes just miss it. We sometimes just miss the reality that God has given us this, that he has poured this opportunity out on us, and we have but to step into it. Philip ran into it. Praise God that he did. And so something happened. So he had an eagerness to go. The next thing that I'm going to just challenge you apart, do your part. Be eager, but then do your part. God's given you the place. You go do. Vince, I just want God to handle it all. No. No. Paul says it in, in uh, Philippians chapter two. And I'm not going to tell you the verse because I want you to read the whole chapter. But in Philippians chapter two, he says, these things which you have seen and heard in me, do them and the peace of God will be upon you. You keep at, I just wish God would give me peace in my life. I just wish the Lord would give me peace. Do them. These things that you have seen in my life and heard me talk about, do them and the peace of God will be upon your life. 
That's just biblical. I'm not changing the wording of that. That's just what it says. You want the peace of God in your life? Do the things of God in your life. We have a part to play. Does God need us? No. Does he choose to use us? Absolutely. And what an honor it is Amen. that I get to be a part of these stories. You get to be a part of these stories today of these people claiming victory, of claiming Jesus in their life. You get to be a part of it. Now the do part is you going, man, you won't believe what happened in church today. We got 30 minutes between services. We done dunked people right in the middle of it. Got sweet tea in the lobby and baptisms happening during the break. That's the kind of church we go to. I walk by, I come up here, I stand next to Stacy. Listen, I come out here doing worship and Stephanie over here stomping going, he won't like that. And I look over here and Stacy just crying down her face. She can't help. She stopped singing because she's got tears everywhere. And I'm going, that's the kind of church I go to. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do my part to share that with anybody that will listen. Because here's the reality. We've all had seasons where we felt like we had nothing to share. And if you're not sharing this season, you're missing it. Do your part. Philip rolled up to him. He said, hey, um, do you understand what you're reading? I love the simplicity of this because it just doesn't. We want to complicate the gospel so much that we feel like we have to have every theological description and, and, and answer. And No, Philip said, hey, I know I just rolled up on you and your chariot and everything here, but uh, I heard you reading Isaiah. I'm pretty familiar with the book. Do you get it? Do you understand it? The next verse, the unit goes, how can I? Like, I, I'm from Ethiopia. This stuff is not, this is not what I grew up with. Yes, I've chose Judaism, but it's not what I've grown up with. So how can I understand it and let somebody explains it to me? And starting with the scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. So it's important that you do your part. It's important that you ask the question. And I, you may never roll up on somebody reading Isaiah. Okay? If you do, they're probably waiting for somebody to roll up on them that doesn't know. But for whatever reason, do you have a question in mind to start a conversation? Hey, man, our family's just been in a great place. Really, is, has God been blessing you? How do you, guys, how do you guys fit Jesus into all that? Oh, we, we don't. Really, man, because I don't know that I could make it without Jesus. Man, work has just been driving me nuts. Well, do you have a place to let go of that stuff, a place to hand that stuff? You know, Jesus tells us to take all our cares to him because he cares for us. I don't know if you know that somebody cares for you like that. Do you know? I'm not asking you to drop theological bombs on them and explain to them what the end times are going to look like because in all reality, unless you know Jesus, it doesn't matter what the end times are going to look like. But have a question to ask. Start the conversation about, gener about Jesus. Start the conversation about God in their lives. Have something to say. And then most importantly, not only having the question, but having an answer. Philip sat down with him, opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news. Now listen, listen, it's, it's okay if you don't know the answer. But please let your answer in that moment be, I don't know. That's a great question. But I bet we can find somebody that does know. Let me make a phone call. Let me dig into this a little bit. I'll get back with you. I'd love to continue this conversation. It's not, it's not complicated. It's just time consuming. And here's the reality. Most of us will choose convenience over conviction in our lives. And I think about Philip wandering around in the desert, following a direction that God gave him. I don't, we don't know how far he walked down the road to Gaza before he saw the Ethiopian. We just know that he walked and he went and he didn't know when God was going to give the opportunity, but when God gave the opportunity, Philip was ready to step into it. I want to give you the scripture in first Peter. It says this now, who is there to harm you if you were zealous to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them. Don't be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Catch this. Always being prepared 
to make a defense to anyone who asks the reason for the hope that is within you. Always being prepared to give an answer for Jesus. Because if I ask you, most everybody knows the Sunday school answer, right? Hey, what, what is the hope in you? Jesus Christ is the hope in my life. That's great. Why? Why? And Peter tells us, he commands us as he writes this to the church, always be ready to give an answer of the hope that is within you. Always be ready. And so Philip sits down with him and says, hey, let me tell you about this Jesus. And he starts in the book of Isaiah. And as he starts, through, and, and Isaiah is just this rich, thick book of, of great stuff about God and prophecy about Jesus. And Philip rolls from Isaiah right into the stories that he lived out as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I can see him sitting there, man, you'll know, there was this day by the seaside when this kid didn't have anything but a happy meal and he rolled up and Jesus told us just to start handing it out. And we handed it to Jesus, he handed it back and every basket just kept filling up. Every time we'd reach in, there was more bread. Every time we'd reach in, there was more fish. And I can't tell you how this Jesus provides. So much so that he even provided all the way to the end when there was no, there was no sacrifice for me because See, Philip would have been in the upper room when Jesus said, this cup, this body that's broken for you. So Philip would have had an understanding of this. And he gave the answer of the hope that is within him. And as they're walking down this road and, and they're in the chariot and Philip's just bumping along with him, got nowhere to be but in the chariot right now with you. And I'm going to tell you, as the guy that he was, the treasure, there would have been a caravan. It wouldn't have been one chariot. It would have been a caravan. And so you say, sit here and go, okay, so what happens next? This is the best part. And the point of this right here, this is how we close it, is what are you waiting for? What is it that you're waiting for? God has given some of you a direction, and he's actually given some of you the thing to do and you're waiting. And so they roll up, and my son brought this to me after church, and uh, he came up to me, he said, hey dad, I was checking, when you were preaching that, I just caught something, I'm what? He's like, it's the desert. I'm like, yeah, that's what it says, that it is a desert place. Y'all remember that part of the verse? It's a desert place. Check out what happens as they continue in verse 36. And while they were going on their way, they came upon some water. Tell me God doesn't have this thing planned out that in a desert place that he makes sure he mentions, there's also enough water there to step down into and be baptized. Tell me God's not intentional. And so here the, they stop. The, the eunuch said, the Ethiopian says, hey, there's water. What's stopping me from being baptized? Why can't we just do this now? Remember, Philip had just shared Jesus with him. Verse 38 tells us they stopped the chariots. They got out of the chariots. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. There's water. What's stopping me? Nothing if you know Jesus. I've just explained him to you. Do you believe that he's the son of God? Do you accept in your heart that he is who he said he is? There's water. Let's do it. There's water. Let's do it. Some of you, I've been talking with you for years about next step, next, hey, it's time. It's time. Some of you were baptized when they were this young. When Miss Terry talked about it before she got baptized. I was baptized when I was nine years old. I remember it. It was good stuff. But I also, I grew up in a church culture where everybody got baptized. Vacation Bible school, if you went forward, you got baptized, man. Church camp, if your buddy went forward, you went forward because you didn't want to be the only one in the seat. So we just all went forward. We got back and they were like, hey, did anybody go forward at church camp? Yes, then we're baptizing you. And whoosh, we're under the water and we got a bunch of people wet. But not a lot of people changed. And some of you, let's just be honest with each other. Some of you can remember the time that you got wet, but it was not a profession. It was not a, this is to show you whose I am and who is mine. Well, let me ask you the same question the eunuch asked. Here's water. What's stopping you? What's stopping you? Oh, Pastor Vince, I, you know, we, we were going to hit salsas right after church. And, and I don't want to, I don't, 
I don't want to go in with wet, wet hair. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, you come get in the water, this is how I'd walk into salsas. I'd be swinging that wet hair everywhere. I'd be swinging it going, hey, let me tell you what happened in church today. I've been putting this off for years, and yet God said, what are you waiting for? And I stepped in it. I don't care if it gets in the cheese dip. Somebody's going to know I made a decision today for Jesus. Amen. Somebody's going to know, yeah, Pastor Vance, it's going to get in my hair. And I'm, Listen, are you going to choose convin- conviction or convenience? Because I see you. I see you every Sunday. My seat is very different. See, all of you are looking at one. And all of me is looking at all of you. And I watch you wrestle on Sundays. I watch some of you wrestle every time this tank comes out and you go, it's me. It's me. I know I need to do that. I know I need to do that. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You know, in all my years of pastoring and growing up in church, I've never, ever, Tim, I've never seen anyone leave the baptism tank grumpy about it. Like never has there been about like that. I don't know what that's all about. No, nobody's walked out going, that was a waste of time. Nobody has ever done that. No, they come up celebrating. They come up with a smile that they don't understand yet. And I get a front row seat for it. And you get a front row seat for it. What are you waiting on? We got shirts, we got towels, we got some shorts. You got nothing stopping you. You got nothing in the way. Look at what it says. The Bible says, this is one of my favorite parts of the story. As Philip goes into the water and he baptizes him, verse 39 comes back in and says, and when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. That word carried right there is the same word we see later in the New Testament in Thessalonians when it talks about Jesus coming back to get us and taking us. It's the same one. In that moment, the unit came up out of the water and Philip's gone. You talk about church, buddy. If I baptize one of you in this service and I leave, one of you better be ready for the 1130. All right, that's all I'm saying. I'll just leave my notes right there because obviously God's got something different for me. And what a day that would be if that's what the Lord chose to do. And the, the, the Ethiopian didn't come up out of the water complaining. The Bible says that he came up out of the water and he didn't see Philip anymore. And he didn't sit there and go, well, that's not how I expected this to happen. No, the Bible says he came up out of the water and he saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because he did his part. God provided a direction. Like some of you right now, some of you showed up today, not even sure why. And God has provided a direction. And you didn't know it was coming, but in this service, now he's given you the thing to do. He's given you the thing to do. And it's time. So I'll tell you, like I told him in the last service, if you want to go get a shirt and shorts, we'll get it done. And we'll do it at the end of this service. We'll do it in between services. You can wait for the beginning of the next service. It doesn't matter to me. We did a baptism this week, Tuesday afternoon, down at the lake by the dam. Why? Because somebody said, I'm going to do my part. And we made it. We were, let's go. Woo! Let's go. I'm not going to stop you from taking this step. But it's your part to do. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Vince, I think that I want to take that step. I want to make sure you understand that this step be clear, this step is an outward profession. It's an outward action of an inward decision of you saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And I believe that Jesus Christ, that son of God died for my sins and he took my sin and he took my shame. And I accept that free gift of salvation. Father, I'm a sinner and I need you as my savior. If you'll, take, if you'll pray that, if you'll just ask God to do that in your life, then this is for you. It's for you. I'm not gonna keep you. You know the option on the table. Here is water. What's stopping you today? So I'm gonna close in prayer. And right outside at that table, a big counter right in front of the place that says change happens 
here. There are gonna be people waiting and they're gonna be waiting on you to do your part, to take the step. And I'm just gonna ask you simply, take it, take it. Father in heaven, I love you. Jesus, I give you all glory, all honor, all praise, because you alone are worthy. Father, I pray that there be somebody here today that realizes that God has orchestrated their steps to come into this service today. To see a path laid before them and to see something they can do. And I pray they'd be obedient. I pray they would answer the call. And Father, I pray that we're ready We're ready for the revival that comes through life change. We're ready for those people who say, here I am. God, do with me what you will. Make us a church that chases after you above all else. And we give you all praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen.